Hello and welcome back to Lawrence Plays Factorio Space Exploration with Crestorio 2. This week we've been continuing with the big endgame puzzle and so that's the big news around here and will be the focus of this video. So if you're trying to avoid spoilers for that you'll, you'll want to skip forward to chapter 2 using the chapter markers on the video timeline where I'll talk about some of the more Factorio-y stuff we've been doing like, you know, poking logistics and fixing processing systems. So without further ado, let's get into that Stargate. Last time I talked about how we put the glyphs onto a sphere using the coordinates we gained from the long range star mapping and decided it could be neatly divided up into 60 triangles as you can see here. We'd also noted that the triangle part of the pyramid cartouches could be assembled together like a jigsaw puzzle which gives us this layout. Since each triangle glyph is associated with a main circle glyph by being in the same pyramid, we can then translate this diagram from triangle glyphs to circular glyphs like this. and. We think this might be useful. This week we did some further experiments to try to confirm our theory that the first glyph you enter into the Stargate picks the triangle on the sphere that you're interested in. You can then overlay the triangle of glyphs onto the triangle on the sphere to allow you to pick another smaller triangle inside the first one to make your selected area a bit more precise. This can then be repeated, loading the appropriate glyphs into the chevrons around the Stargate, narrowing the search point in closer and closer to a smaller and smaller triangle. This is a great theory, but some testing is required to find out whether the gate actually works like this. And while I was messing around with other things, Tristan was busy programming the Stargate and trying to confirm these theories. He had some useful successes here, including working out that for the first layer, the top of the initial triangle seems to point to the middle of the pentagon that makes up the dodecahedron, and then on subsequent layers, the top of the triangle is the corner that points either up or down, not off to the side. As an additional check for this, Tristan checked the top corners of two adjacent triangles where the tips touch, and these came back with very similar coordinates. And you can see that here in the Informatron if we look at the uh, the history of the glyph sequences we sent. So over here we have the, the four glyph first, and then we've got the four and the headless guy. Um, and from each of those, we've then gone for the very, very top corner of the glyph as much as we possibly can. So this is the, uh, the up pointing arrow, which takes you always right into the top corner as much as possible. And if you look at the numbers we've got out of here, these are very, very similar, down to about six decimal places, at least for the X coordinates, similarly for the Y, and also for the Z. So these seem to be more or less the same place, and to six, six decimal places is, is pretty good. However, it does seem a little bit odd to me that given this is, seems to be the sort of the map, more or less the maximum level of accuracy we can get, that there's still so many digits afterwards showing up different numbers. I, it'll be interesting to see how close we actually managed to get to the target coordinate once we've gone through and found the exact, exactly the correct triangle all the way through right to the end. To make things a little bit more complicated or at least harder to visualize, the triangle diagrams we've drawn us are as they're seen from inside the sphere, not outside. This does make a certain amount of sense because, well, they're supposed to be the constellations we're seeing out there in the sky from, from inside this galaxy that we're in at the moment, but having it backwards like that is a bit of an extra complication to have to think about because the easiest way to visualise this when you're working on it is with the sphere we've been showing you, which we are clearly seeing from outside it because then you can see a lot more. If we go inside the sphere, no matter where we put the camera, you can only see a little bit of it at a time. So it's much harder to visualise it in a way that makes sense in my own little brain. With the information that we've gathered about how we believe the sphere and the triangles and the glyphs work, we should in theory have enough data to come up with a solution to the puzzle, as we can calculate the positions of each sub-triangle, or more specifically, we can calculate how far across the triangle the target point falls, and therefore work out which one should be the next triangle that it appears in on the next level down. This is made a bit more complicated by a couple of factors, however. Firstly, because we're working on the surface of a sphere rather than with actual flat triangles, we can't just work out linear distances across the surface of the triangle and then calculate the next triangle's position. We need to take the sort of the bulge of the sphere into account. And whilst when we get especially when we get down to the really small triangles, this is going to be very, very minor, probably even insignificant, because the triangles will be such a small part of the surface of the sphere that they will be very, very close to flat. Because the early ones are going to be a bit more affected by this, this bulge for want of a better word, any inaccuracies at this point will be massively amplified by the time we get down to the really, really small triangles later on, so we need to be quite careful about it. We can check our numbers at any time by getting a reading from the Stargate though. It's kind enough to report back what coordinates we're poking each time we run it and get these sort of figures out you can see here. 
However, it would be nice to come up with an actual proper theoretical mathematical solution rather than mathematical approximations which we then have to tidy up a little bit by using empirical measurements. The second issue that makes this a little bit more awkward than it would otherwise be is that we're working on a triangular grid instead of a square one, which means that visualising and calculating the positions is it's a little bit harder. We can't just go, well, the x value is greater than this corner's x value, so that means it's inside this sector. We have to actually think about the line that we're drawing and then calculate whether the point we're looking at is on the inside or outside of it. So it makes it a little bit harder, but I think we will be able to work with it. As a bit of an aside, we noticed while we were playing that the, uh, the, the actual components of the Stargate, so the chevrons like this one and the platform over here, all have circuit, connection, con circuit connectors on them, as you can see on the end of here uh, and also on the side up here. Unfortunately, we discovered after we plugged into them uh, and to see what, what they would do, that if you mouse over them, it says not implemented yet in the pop-up in the corner, which is um, slightly unhelpful. We were, we were hoping that we were going to be able to do something useful, like loading the chevrons directly with the glyphs we wanted them to be using, rather than having to spin the big wheel and poke the glyphs manually into them. So it's a bit of a, bit of a shame we can't do that, but I guess that's something that maybe will be implemented in a future version of space exploration, or maybe it'll be reckoned that that makes it a bit too easy and that people will just come up with computers that would brute force every single possibility until one of them opens in the correct place, uh, rather than actually going through the maths of it. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what appears in a, late, in a later version. And so now you're up to date with where our thoughts have got to so far. We do need to do some work outside the game with the numbers and calculate which glyphs we should be programming in. And, and then in the next stream, we shall see what happens when we do it, when we actually program those glyphs into the Stargate, hit the uh, big shiny button and find out where we're pointing it at. If it turns out that we're wrong after all of these assumptions and calculations, I'm not sure what we're going to do next. Uh, probably the first step will be to calculate the vector without reversing it first, because if you remember, we've taken this vector from inside the, uh, the spaceship's log files and gone, okay, so this is the direction we came out in, therefore if we want to go back home, we go in the opposite direction. So if that fails, then I guess we'll try and work out which, which series of glyphs would, take, would give us this vector. Um, but that, that feels wrong, but it will be a second place to start, which won't, have to, which won't involve ripping up our entire theory and starting again from scratch. Um, but if that doesn't work, then... Well, I guess we'll have to rethink our entire plan. And since all of our thoughts have been based around the sort of things I've been talking about, that's going to require a lot of extra thinking, and I'm, I'm not quite sure where we'd start off with that. I might have to hand it off to the more mathematically-minded people in the, in the group to see what they come up with. But, uh, yeah, that'll be um, fun. So, wish us luck. Hopefully our, uh, our theories are all correct, and we will find that when we turn on the Stargate, we'll get a, a, a nice path home, and we'll be back in Thyrus and our home planet in, uh, in, in no time at all. So... Fingers crossed. So, welcome back to those of you who don't want to be spoiled. I shall try to be quite careful from this point onwards, even if I am starting out here in Fenestra where there's a bit of stuff set up. But this is all fairly standard Factorio stuff, so I don't think it's going to be too bad. We did dis discover that all of the shenaniganry that I've been referring to was quite expensive in the old power consumption, so we'd managed to rip through a lot of the matter over here. As you can see, these tanks are now practically empty. That's even worse than I, th I realised. So these machines up here are going to be struggling to refill many more of these cans, although at the moment we do seem to be okay. We've run out of empties and we do have 2,000 stockpiled in here. So it's not doing too badly, but it's something we would like to be in ensure carries on working properly. And so Tristan sent the spaceship off from here because it was it was still in manual mode. We haven't actually automated the matter transfer ship because we don't seem to need all that much of it. So it was sent off manually and it bimbled off merrily through the cosmos to go back to Norbit and refill its tanks here. So we've got the, yeah, we've got the tanks up here. Oh, and they have been refilled and the ship is on its way out again. However, things didn't go quite that smoothly from the very beginning. Unfortunately, on the way back over, it ran out of power. So the, uh, the fuel cells that are keeping the electricity going ran out. And so that meant that, well, the ship still had quite a lot of momentum. This thing is bimbling along at a merry speed of um, 68, apparently. That seems to be its, uh, its top speed. I guess it's fairly big and chonky and heavy. Um, but that meant it had quite a lot of momentum. So when the power died, it just kept moving. But the lasers stopped firing. And so it had an encounter with some of these asteroids that are just sort of gradually appearing in space around it. And that managed to punch some holes in the front of it. That meant that a rescue mission was required. And so Tristan flew out in another ship to come over and, um, and, and work out what had gone on. What had gone wrong with the ship. Why it was having an absolute crisis. And it turned out that the, the, the problem was sort of... It was a slightly funny problem. So these tanks in the ship were empty, which uh, you'd expect because it was on its way back over uh, to, to go and refill them in order to take more matter out. But because this ship burns the matter, that meant that this matter assembler here was, didn't have any matter that it could pull out of these tanks to, to put into the, into, the new, um, into the new fuel cells. 
Now, in theory, that shouldn't have been a problem because there's a stockpile of fuel cells remaining in this chest over here. We have a quantity of them available in there all the time, so there's plenty of those to keep the ship running. So, technically, it hadn't actually run out of fuel. The problem was that when you burn through one of these uh, one of these singularity fuel cells, when it empties, it goes into the slot over here, and you get an empty singularity fuel cell there. And the idea is that that then gets passed through back into the uh, that matter assembler here by this inserter to be refilled and to go back round again. Great, nice and simple system, should work perfectly. Emphasis on the should there. However, it ran into a problem where the uh, there was no room to put any more dead fuel cells into here because it couldn't fill any more of them up. So this, this input was full, the output was empty, but the input was full over here, but there was no, no matter. And so eventually that meant that the output of the reactor also filled up completely, and then we weren't, so we weren't able to put the empty one from here, I suppose, or the one that had just been used, into the output, and therefore we couldn't start burning a new one. So the, uh, the, uh, the fix for this is rather simple. You just put in a buffer on the output side here like this as well. And so now any empty fuel cells that can't be dealt with will be passed out here, will go into this chest, and eventually will be put back into the matter assembler to be refilled again. Um, and so as long as we've got a decent buffer here, which we have at the moment, you can see there's 15 of them in here, plus another six in here, that's easily enough to fly all the way back to Norbit. But as long as you've got those there, we can then store all the empty ones in here until it's ready to refill them again. So the problem shouldn't happen again. This should be absolutely fine now. This should be a complete not a complete fix, but we'll wait and see. And so now with ship has just arrived back in Finestra, which is very nice, we're now draining these tanks back out through into the tanks over here, which means the, uh, the matter can be passed up to the two matter assemblers over here. And we've got plenty now. Well, I mean, as you saw, we had we actually had plenty in, in them beforehand. There was still the 2,000 in each of them. But this way, we've now got a, a nice amount of, uh, of buffer of available over here and once these tanks have emptied we can send the ship off again to go and refill once again and come over with a with a, with a load more matter just so we can make sure that we don't run out uh, we can keep powering everything out here and it will all run nicely the next thing to talk about is is the flow of naquium through the system or from naquiatite to naquium and and beyond and so the obvious place to start with that is going to be out in melancholia because that's where a lot of our naquatite is coming from these days and mike has said that one of the things he has done is adding more labels to the map so let's have a look and see what he's put in there Right, so he's got a couple of new tags down here. So yes, he's expanded out the Naquatite production by putting in another couple of little mining outposts because there's a couple of very, very small asteroids out here uh, that have a, have a decent amount of Naquium on them. Let's have a look. How much have we got? We've got 171,000 and another 369,000. So it's not an enormous amount, but it's enough to be useful and enough to sort of, you know, we, the, the, given how close it is, it'd be kind of silly not to harvest this stuff. He's also labelled the Arco Hub over here, which is the area around the Arco Link storage device up here, which is the uh, the teleport chest that takes all of the Naquatite over to Talos to be further processed. So that's really uh, that's a, a, a very valuable area. This is basically the, the centre of this whole area because this is where everything is brought into. And then he's got the Western Hub over here, where he's put in an, an additional new mine over here, which has a potential potentially 66,000 Naquatite along with the 3.1 million and the 1.7 million plus 25,000 up there. And all of that is getting passed through into a number of stations over here. And he set up an interesting system over here, which is... Um it's different from the way I do things, but it is quite interesting. So I'm, uh, I'm sort of glad he did because it gives me something novel and unusual to talk about. And so the idea he's got here is he's got various different controls on the different belts around here. So this station at the bottom should fill up first. And then when this one is largely full, or when there is a lot of Naquatite flowing through, it will then start flowing into the second one. And if there's enough flowing in to keep both of those satisfied, then we'll start to flow into the third one as well. And the way he's done that is through reading off the belts down here. And he's looking at this one, he's saying, read, read off these two as a whole. So we will always be telling the, the rest of the circuit system how much Naquatite is on these two belts. Then up here he's saying, if there's more than 14 on the belts, which isn't full, full would be 16, but if the belts are mostly full, then we want the, these ones to run. So if these belts are mostly full, then we have a decent amount of Naquatite coming through. In that case, we want these ones up here to flow as well. And uh, then we monitor those as well and pass it on to these two. And here we're saying, if those ones are above 14, then let it flow on the next ones as well. So the idea being, that it sort of passes along and along and along all the uh, all the different belts through here. And if there's if there's enough to keep this belt very, very happy, then we'll flow this one as well. If there's enough to keep both of them happy, then we'll flow the third one and so on and so on across there. Now, this does mean that it's going to be a little bit bursty on these belts. If we had, say, 42 pieces of Naquatite coming through per per belt, should we say, that's not really a very good measurement number, but let's, let's just say we did. Therefore, these, these would run flat out. We'd see 16 on those. Therefore, these would say, aha, that's more than 
than 14, so these should run. But that would mean we then drop down to having only partially full belts running through here, and so then these ones would cut, cut out. So then these ones would fill, out, fill, fill up again, so these ones would cut out. So these would be a bit wibbly. They, the numbers would bounce up and down constantly uh, while it tried to keep it balanced. However, that doesn't actually matter. It just means that we're going to be feeding most of the Naquitite through to this station, and then a bit of it through to here. If we then expand the flow even further, so we have a bit more coming in from the mines over here, then that would mean that this one would then flow all the time, this one maybe would flow all the time, and this one would be a little bit bursty or a little bit choppy. And so it would mean that essentially we're prioritising the station at the bottom, but not not to quite to 100%. But then, sort of, but then if there's more than enough for this one, then we'll send quite a lot through to here, and, so, and then quite a lot through to this one. Personally, if I was setting this up, I'd probably have just run it along here until this one was completely full, and then when we have more than a certain amount in here, run it through to this one, and then we have when we have more than more than a slightly larger certain amount in here, run it through to this one, which would mean that it would fill up this one, then it would fill up this one, then it would fill up this one, and so on, all the way up here. However, Mike has done something different, and different is always is always a good thing because it's interesting, and rather than just re repeating the same sort of systems we've done over and over again, I, I, yeah, I like to see like to see things implemented in a different way. But as you can see over here, well, we're not we're not pumping it through. We seem to have got to a point where we have enough naquitite, uh, which is a bit bizarre position to be in. But the trains are not coming over to here, and that's not because of a problem, at least not so not out in Melancholia. It's because if we look over here as well, you can see that this system is backed up all the way. Everything is completely full, and this is despite some additional upgrades that Mike has been doing, like upgrading the uh, the belts along here. So this is all now deep space. We've got deep space loaders along here, so we're pumping a huge amount through here. Um, I assume yes, deep space belts all the way up to here. Deep space loaders loading into this warehouse. Deep space loaders taken out of here and into the into the Arco link at the top. So everything from here onwards is capable of running at the full 90 per second per belt, or 630 per second in total, because there's seven belts going into here. So once we have a good drain on the other end, we should be able to get a huge amount of Naquitite flowing through here. And we'll go over and have a look at Talos in a moment, and see why we're not getting any flow at the moment, because I, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised. I was expecting the system to be running. But I should also mention that Mike has also now put in the, uh, the beacons over here, so he's now sped up most of these mining drills. He's put it in on the edge, which means it's not picking up all of the drills, rather than knocking out one of the the drills in order to speed lots of the one lots of them up from in the middle and it means it's slightly slower but it does mean we won't don't have any worries about the exact coverage area now how far do these drills stick out so it's two squares no three squares on each side so actually he could have taken out this drill and put in the beacon instead and we you still managed to get all the naquitite out of the the patch and the whole system would have run a bit faster but sticking it over to the side i guess means that it's not taking out one of the drills it looks perhaps slightly neater and I believe he's done that elsewhere as well. So yes, you can see a couple of beacons down here affecting these these uh, mining areas. Down here, yep, there's a beacon there. But this one actually gets the whole area, and um, as no, no, this one doesn't quite because these are smaller smaller patches. And I think he'll have done the same over here as well. So yep, there we go. There's a couple of beacons around the around the patch to to make the make the drills run that bit faster. And that brings them up to plus 500% of their normal speed, which is that's pretty good. The drills the drills are going to struggle a bit because naquitite is difficult to mine up. So having these speed bonuses in there is going to make a big difference to the amount that could be pulled out. There is still a little bit of potential for expansion out here, so as you can see Mike has tagged another patch up here as another possible expansion point where there is a bit more nacritite. Uh, oh, and, the, and over here as well, and there may and, and if, if necessary he may be able to go further out and find even more nacritite as, as and when necessary. However, I suspect we will probably have finished the game before all of these patches are, uh, are fully plundered. And so next up, well, I said I'd go and have a look at Talos and find out why the Nacrotite wasn't flowing, and we can see that it, well, it's not flowing. But over here, we've now, I've now upgraded, or I've now finished off the system over here. I think I talked about this last week, actually. We've now got, uh, we've, got we've got the seven belts of Nacrotite coming out, and we've got all the processing required to deal with it over here. And I got that built up last week, but it was buffering, it was producing far too much water. It turns out that Nacrotite isn't so much a crystal as when it comes to ore, an ore, it's more of a slurry. There's a lot of water in it that comes from the acid that's used to mine it, and so you produce a lot of water when you crush it down into the into the crushed form and that was previously going into this tank here and then in theory being passed off down this pipe to be used for everything that it's needed for down here which is mostly making acid and, and maybe a few oh and making with the water ice as well which we're shipping back through however it wasn't getting used up fast enough so I decided uh, whatever I'm just gonna get rid of it all and so I shoved in a load of extra uh, flare stacks along here that are just blowing the water off into the atmosphere where it will then come down as rain it'll, it'll land in the in the lakes up here or over here or wherever or this lake over here where we're pulling the water back out of and then pulling it back over to turn that into the water ice. So it's not the best way of doing it. 
that having having the water being recycled by bringing it down this pipe was quite nice when we, when it was working. However, we ran into the problem where we were just we just overfilled on water up here. It wasn't being got rid of fast enough. So having in some extra flare stacks along here w was what we needed. It turns out the flare stack we already had over here was insufficient. We couldn't one flare stack was not enough to get rid of all the water. Anyway, this does seem to be coming through. The aquatite is flowing through nicely as you as you'd expect. It's being pulverized down, and we seem to have jammed up the belts along here. And if we follow it along, we can see that yes, we have too much crushed naquatite over here. And it's not because the naquatite is flowing, it has been, has backed up. We don't seem to have enough of it for it to be flowing through here. And we've got a green light on the belt saying we do need more naquium ingots. And so that means we presumably have a shortage of something. So looking down here, yes, you can see that the system down here is not running. We have plenty of the um, of the naquatite powder, but we don't have any of the refined naquatite. That's not coming through because of because, and let's see if we can get this right. We're looking over here, it's because we have too much water in the output. So <laughs> the water has been a problem down here as well. Oh, for goodness sake. So I guess that means I could could fix this by coming along here and flipping around. Where is the, where's the pump? There's the pump, flipping the pump. And that will suck the water back out of this system here. Uh, this is a horrible, horrible stopgap uh, fix, but that should mean, yes, there we go. Now the system is running again over here. We are now pumping water out of the lake, bringing it along, along here, and then pumping it through here in order to blow it off in the flare stack. So this is a silly, silly fix, and I need to go in and do it properly. However, that does show that the problem over here is simply down to the amount, down to us having too much water over here. Uh, so that's a bit of a nonsense, uh, we're gonna, but we're going to have to put in some controls on that, on that pump to make sure that it doesn't pump water through when there's already too much of it down in the lower, in the lower systems. However, you can now see that we have the, uh, the refined naquatite flowing through here again. We're able to start cooking it. Eventually, we'll start to get more ingots coming out, although it's taking a little while for that to all filter through and for, for it to be cooked through. Uh, but more importantly, you can see that we're now starting to flow the flow the uh, crushed naquatite through from the train and from the processing system over here, which means if we go back over to Melancholia again, you can see that this is starting to trickle through again. Now, this is quite a bit slower than I would expect it to run. When, when the system is running full whack, I would expect at least four of these belts to be running solidly. Or rather, I guess that means all of these belts should be running at about half speed. But because of the way the system is set up down here, when there is a train in the station, we are prioritizing unloading from the train. And then when the train goes, we will then prioritize pulling from the this belt here so it's a little bit funny it's a little bit imbalanced it's not quite ideal for balancing between the two supplies however I don't really know what to do about that I guess I could put controls on here to say only put only run from these belts when there's less than a certain amount in here that's probably going to be the best way to do it and that will mean we'll then prioritize the input that's coming from melancholia instead of the input that's coming from stardust and that makes sense because transporting stuff from Melancholia to Talos is free because it just goes through the teleport chest, whereas transporting stuff from Stardust to Talos is a little bit more expensive because we have to pay for fuel and train batteries to run these things and, and elevator cables. And it, it's all, there's a little bit more in there. There's a bit more to, to the uh, logistics system than just chucking it in a teleport chest and hoping for the best. But there we go. Now you can see that because the train has gone, this belt is now running full, fully and solidly. And we, well, I need to put in the second one along here because we still can't run it quite at 100%. But if we take another look out in Melancholia, you can now see that these, these belts are now running a little bit faster. They, yes, they're still jerking and, and stoppy startying because we only have the one purple belt feeding in here. And this is quite capable of dealing with two. And that means we're also depleting the amount of uh, crushed naquatite that's in this warehouse because we have two, two belts leading, taking it away. However, I need to put in these underground belts along here and there aren't any on the planet. So at the moment, it's limited by the, uh, by the output rate from the crushing stage over here. Uh, and once I once I have a load of these underground belts and we can upgrade this, we should get a lot more coming through. Although notably, it does seem to only be a blue belt coming in here at the moment. Now, I think that's a mistake. I think this should be purple a bit further through and there should probably be a purple splitter in here, taking a lot of the air uh, crush that's coming out of these machines as well. <clears throat> because the cap because the system should be capable of producing almost two purple belts, and with this actually with the productivity modules in here, maybe it is capable of producing two purple belts, and we could run it just off the system here. But anyway, whatever, whatever, we need to we need to put in these purple undergrounds in order to get this running properly, and then we'll be able to have a good flow of coming in here. However, as the system is working with the train system as well, I believe the train will come down and be able to top up this warehouse before it gets too close to being emptied. So I think we should be okay running at this speed. And the system is just is generally pretty happy, but there are some other improvements we could still make. And here comes the train to unload again. So yeah, we're, we're only down to 350 stacks, and then it starts to fill back up again. The, it'd be interesting to see whether whether it fill, fills up completely from what's available in the train, 
And it looks like it's probably going to. It is still pouring out quite quickly. Yes, there we go. The train is, has, has, hasn't emptied yet and the warehouse is full. There's still another 3,000 in there. Still another third of a warehouse, in fact. So yeah, there's plenty on the train. And now we're, and now we're, uh, we're supplying it mostly from the train because there's eight belts feeding it in, whereas there's only one belt feeding it in from the uh, Melancholia system. So you can see it, it ba bounces back and forth between which one it's using most of. There were a few other things I had to fix out on Talos as well. So I'd set up the system a little while ago to bring down the, uh, the train back batteries and the meteor defense ammo down in the um, in the standard stock train that brings stuff down to here um, in order to then send them off down this belt and pass them over to melancholia where mike is then going to use them to run his trains and defend his uh, outpost from the meteor attacks great so that that was um in theory that should have worked quite nicely however I forgot that I'd hard-coded these inserters across here to always take out anything that isn't iridium vitalic reagent methane ice or vulcanite from this warehouse and put it into this one and that made sense at the time because those were the only four things that were being kept up here and there were more than four things being kept down here so rather than set up some sort of clever what is in this warehouse well we'll send away the things we don't want system I instead just said well we don't want to send away those things we just want to send away everything else so I use blacklists and that worked for quite a long time while we we're only having the four things that were being stored up here it worked perfectly however I forgot I'd set it up like that and so when I started bringing down meteor defense ammo and train batteries to here as well well, they were also being unloaded by these inserters and put into the chests down here. I hadn't noticed that had happened when I reset the uh, the counters last week, and so it meant that when I reset them and said we want to have 200 of each of the of each of those two things in the logistic system in general, I hadn't counted on the number that were in here, and so there were a load of extra ones in there. I, I then did spot those because it failed again and I went, hang on a minute, I've sorted out the power problems, we shouldn't be seeing that sort of problem anymore. So I came down and eventually I discovered that there were a load stockpiled in here and so I set up some. I set up this, this uh, inserter over here with a filter to take out the things that shouldn't be in this warehouse and pass them back through and that's tidied it up nicely. But then in order to make sure it didn't happen again, I've done the system the way I should have done in the first place, where we have a green cable that's looking at the inventory in this warehouse, passing it over to this constant combinator, which is outputting enormous negative numbers of all the things that are supposed to stay in here. And so that means we've now got a number on that cable that is everything that is in this warehouse but shouldn't be. Uh, and then negative numbers of things that should be, but we don't care about that because filters don't use negative numbers when they're deciding how to set the filters. We then pass those into the stack filter inserters here, set them, we set the filters based on that signal. And that means that these filter inserters will take out anything that is in this warehouse, but not listed in this combinator. And that works really well because we've now got a much larger number of things we can put in here. So we've got the four basic items that were in there before. But we've now also got enriched vulcanite and meteor defense ammo and train pa uh, power packs. Uh, and as you can see, as these cables come in, they are going well they're not on the list so they immediately get passed through into the into the warehouse down here and then probably down into this one when it's ready for them which means they can be passed off along here and so that ensures that the things we want to pass out upwards stay in this warehouse and so we've now got a nice healthy belt of enriched vulcanite here any batteries or meteor ammo that come down will be passed up here and they can be passed on to where they need to go and dealt with appropriately once I sorted that out, it turned out there were rather a lot of batteries in there, and so we ended up with them overfilling this uh, box down here and backing up along the belt, which means that in theory, if we then brought out any meteor defense ammo later, then the system would jam up, we wouldn't be able to pass it through, and because it, it would it would get stuck on this belt, and so Mike could in theory run out of meteor ammo. So in order to deal with that, I emptied the system again by passing or by turning off the filters on here and just telling these to run all the time, dumping out all the batteries, all the meteor defense ammo, flowed all that through into melancholia and then went through and reset the numbers to, to zero by uh, resetting the the, com the, uh, the memory cell combinator and then passed through another 200 of each which came down here and now the system is happy and everything is where it should be. This does mean that Melancholia has got rather a lot more of these various items than it was in really expecting to receive but Mike has, uh, knows what this game can be like and has put in a warehouse over there so he's got loads and loads of storage space and you know they're consumables so they'll get used up eventually. We can see just how excessive this is by looking at the number on this pylon over here. And yes, he's got 1,200 more meteor defense ammo than he was expected, than he's actually asking for, and 843 more train batteries. So those are significant numbers, but oh well, never mind. <laughs> It's not like they're that expensive, and as I say, we'll churn through them eventually in the, in, in the long run. Notably from here, you will see that he does also have a shortage of sulphur, and that is because all the sulphur from here has been passed through, the belt is completely empty, and we have a bit of a shortage, shortage of sulphur over here. And so that's the next phase of the, of the problems, we don't, we're not getting in the sulphur through here fast enough. 
and this was a problem that was coming all the way from back over on uh, in Norbit. We had a rather significant shortage of, of the amount of sulfur that was being brought over here. Uh, so this is, the, this is the spaceship that flies over to Talos, bringing out the sulfur and various other things. And at the moment, it's only waiting for the uh, Vitalic reagent, and technically it'll bring out any other methane ice that's brought over, but it's not actually waiting for that. It's wait specifically waiting for the Vitalic reagent, which we've had some problems with, which I shall talk about tomorrow. However, we did previously have a severe problem with the amount of uh, sulphur being brought over here. And sulphur is used in quite a few places. It's being taken out for the um, Naquium processing there. It's being taken out to uh, Stardust in huge quantities for the Naquitite production out there, because that needs acid. It's being taken out to Talos again in another ship for the uh, for producing sulfuric acid for beryllium production. And it's, it's, it is being brought out back from Taras, which helps quite a bit, because we do have a supply coming from there. And it's also being taken out to Bigrid. And so all of these, all of these places demanding enormous quantities of sulphur meant that the logistics system couldn't keep up. We were bringing up a certain amount of sulphur. We had this train over here, was bringing it up from, the, from down on the ground. Over in the train handover area, we had this belt bringing in sulphur for wherever needs it, and one of those places was to put it into that train. So the train would fill up from here, it would take it up to orbit, and it would, and, uh, and it would unload it all. So yes, the sulphur would arrive here, but the problem is, the train then had to go quite a long way from here, all the way over to the elevator, down the elevator, fill up down there, come back up again, travel all the way over here, and then unload it again. And I think it was also picking up trash from the, uh, from the warehouses over here on the way down as well, so that's another thing for it to be doing. And so that was taking quite a long time, and even worse, when it was down here filling up, it was only being filled up at the rate of one green belt, which isn't really enough, um, especially as that green belt is being shared with lots and lots of other things around here. In fact, it looks like there's only a blue belt of it being brought up, so that's, that's, that's woefully inadequate. We were not bringing the sulphur through remotely fast enough. And so, in order to fix this, I decided, okay, sulphur is clearly a bulk shipment item, so that means it should be coming from the bulk shipment area. So I've put in a new set station over here, which is demanding sulphur, and this means that the trains will come over, will unload here. So previous previous stations, we've been monitoring, saying when the station is uh, less than well, in this case less than ten thousand, set the train limits to uh, to one. It'll call out a train, a train will come over, will drop off some uh, holmium cables. For the sulphur, it's taking so long to fill all the buffers up that I've put in two in two combinators over here, and these are watching for well zero and zero. So if this warehouse here is ever empty the system will immediately call for two trains to bring over sulphur. Uh, and so we'll get two trains with the sulphur arriving. That will easily fit into the warehouse, so we'll never overflow. But we will have, we're bringing out quite a lot each time it thinks it's run out. That then flows down here, goes into this station, and then when a train comes down from here, we can load it up at 12 green belts of uh, flow, at least from the buffer in the warehouse. And then the buffer is, yes, the buffer's being filled up by two green belts along here. So the whole system is running much, much faster than it was before. Coupled with that, I've also put in an additional train here, so you can see we've now got two sulphur trains, and so to make sure we don't end up with train jams, we have a waiting point here. The trains will come in, will, will come up, they'll come into this waiting station, and then they'll come out of here and go into the unloading station here. And as long as we keep the supply of sulphur up and healthy on the ground, the trains will always be, this, the spare train will always be waiting up here, because it unloads more slowly here than it loads up on the ground. So we should, should never have two trains waiting down on the ground, causing a jam down there. And this has worked uh, for the time being, certainly. We now have, as you can see, a plentiful supply of sulphur up here. We have a train that's trying to unload, and we have another train waiting to come in and unload when there's a more demand. The problem is now, as I was saying, with the Vitalic reagent, and that is something I'm going to be talking about tomorrow. So, thank you very much for watching. I hope you'll come back tomorrow, where I will, as I say, be talking about the... Uh, I'll be talking about the Immersite, I'll be talking about the Vitalic reagent, I'll be talking about science, I'll be talking about everything that's going on up here, all the tinkering that's been going on, and thinking about what, what's going to come next. We will also be back for another stream on Monday when, all going well, we might actually finish the game. Fingers crossed we will actually complete the Stargate puzzle. We'll point the Stargate back home and see where that takes us. We do also want to then do the uh, Spaceship Victory, so that might take a little bit longer, but we are pretty close to being finished, I think. I will then be back on Wednesday for another Satisfactory stream, where I'm also relatively close to being finished. This is one of those where I've now started making all of the things I need to complete the game. However, I need to make them in rather large quantities, and at the moment it's going to take somewhere in the order of 30 hours of production to make the number I need. Now, I don't want to just go AFK and leave the game running, so I'm going to be trying to build up the production rate and make things go a little bit faster. But there's quite a lot of work to be done in there. However, the end is sort of in sight, it's just quite a long way away in the distance. 
And then at the weekend, I'll be back for more summary videos talking about what may or may not be our final stream. And so one of the next things we're going to be wanting to do is create some sort of retrospective videos, talking about how space exploration went, what we liked, what we didn't like, how things went, what, what, we, what we've done, interesting things we've made, and how, how, how everything has been going. And so I'd be very interested to hear your questions. If there's anything you'd like us to have a look at, if you have any questions about why we did things or how we did things, how things work, any of that sort of thing, then please let me know in the, in the video comments or on the Discord, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll have a discussion. And, uh, and talk through any questions that come in and, and of course credit you with, uh, with, with, with whatever questions you ask. So those are going to be videos that are coming out in the future. So again, that's another reason to be subscribed to the channel so you don't miss out on them. And as always, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.